Hey guys, thank you for watching. Yvonne Blasco is here, certified exercise physiologist and personal trainer. Um, this video is about the role of resistance training in the treatment of obesity. Um, this video, I'm really excited about doing this. I spent a lot of time preparing for it, so sit back, enjoy when you get a minute um, to really, you know, basically watch this video and, and really kind of, um, you know, delve into it with me as I go into this. But basically, the study is a 2015 study that's called The Role of Resistance Training for Treatment of Obesity-Related Health Issues and for Changing Health Status of the Individual Who Is Over Fat or Obese, a review. Now, um, the author of this paper, I actually contacted uh, back in 2014, and I have this correspondence in my inbox. And um, I'm just going to kind of summarize kind of the points of this um, I guess this talk, this presentation, if you will. Um, also, be, be sure to check the video description. I will list the studies supporting this talk. Um, but anyway, anyhow, basically I disagreed with this uh, paper. I disagreed on the emphasis of resistance training for the treatment of obesity. Um, I, I talked about how resistance training has an anabolic effect in the body and how obese individuals are already overly in an, an, in an overly anabolic state via their overfat, okay? So this is a mismatched exercise mode for the current metabolic status of an obese individual. In fact, research by Dr. Forbes uh, finds, um, clearly il illustrates this, okay? The more weight we have to lose, the easier it is to lose up to a certain plateau point. The less weight we have to lose, the harder it is to lose, okay? Uh, so instead of utilizing resistance training in the beginning of a program uh, in an obese population, when there's more weight to be lost, we should utilize it when the, when, when, the, when the person has less weight to lose. And this has a twofold benefit. Number one, um, it prevents the lowering of rest of metabolic rate when, when there's less weight to be lost. So we add weight training later so we can preserve muscle mass and resting metabolic rate. And this lean body mass preservation will literally bust the plateau and muscle out the fat, okay? Um, I've talked about this before. The, 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 I call it the double-edged sword theory where you have this is your skin, this is your muscle in between is the subcutaneous fat layer. So when we just do cardio, we're just kind of taking the top off. We're not doing anything for muscle. So muscle can stay or it'll be reduced. Okay, So you basically have that same layer of subcutaneous fat. You do weight training, you're not, doing anything, you're not taking anything off the top of cardio. So you increase muscle, uh, you're not really taking that much fat off the top or fat will increase because of the anabolic signal. In some cases, I'll go into this, okay? Um, but if you do both, now you really close the space, the subcutaneous layer, okay? So that's, that's what I refer to as muscling out the fat. Um, so if, you, if we utilize resistance training in the beginning of a program for an obese population, we take an already anabolic obese individual and now we capitalize on this already anabolic environment by adding an additional anabolic stimulus in the form of resistance training. This is why anecdotally, and by the way, for those who may um, you know, discredit anecdotes and anecdotal evidence, while, while it's not research, it counts because research oftentimes starts out as anecdotes or hypotheses, okay? So anecdotally, I've seen clients or members bulk up when they lift weights. And what happens is, and what I find is they're getting muscle anabolic, so they're, they're making their, their muscle tissue anabolic while body fat stays the same. And this gives the temporary appearance of getting bigger and bulkier, okay? So your muscle grows, your fat stays the same, and so it kind of makes you look bigger because you're kind of expanding and your fat stores remain the same. Um, so resistance training is simply not a high enough calorie burning activity and the highly acclaimed after effects of you know, how resistance training burns more fat at rest and you build more muscle, you burn more fat, you boost your rest and metabolic rate, these effects are minimal at best. Um, and, and check out the card on resistance training. I mean, um, check out the card above on resting metabolic rate, uh, the, the effects of weight training on resting metabolic rate, or muscle mass, I should say, okay? Um, Dr. Chris Melby, I actually met him in 2003 in an ACSM conference in Reno. Uh, I attended one of his seminars, and he's published a lot of research on resistance training and its, and its metabolic effects. Um, he's a big advocate for resistance training, but he realizes the reality of resistance training, and that is pretty futile at expediting and stimulating fat loss. It plays a role, but it's not the key role player. Remember that.
All right, so back to this, uh, the, the original study where, where basically uh, this video is um, you know, kind of based on. So this author didn't tackle the weight control or weight loss aspect of resistance training or, uh, versus cardio or concurrent training because I presume that the evidence is quite strong in support of cardio beating out, beating out resistance training from a weight loss perspective, okay? And concurrent training has actually been and is being shown to be more potent for building muscle, believe it or not. Um, a la uh, our concept of try bodybuilding. Uh, me and my friend Evan, we, we started that. We have a Facebook group too, which is basically concurrent training at, at the highest level, where you take bodybuilding training and you combine it with triathlon training. Um, in fact, there was a presentation, I believe his name is Dr. Murdoch. I think he's out of University of Kentucky. In fact, you can look at that link there. Uh, I'll put that card up, his presentation in full. We actually kind of uh, addresses this concurrent training, uh, you know, the whole idea that it interferes with strength or, or really, and, and, and you know, and when we look at strength, there, there's a difference between strength and hypertrophy or muscle size gains. They're not necessarily correlated. Sometimes you can get stronger and not gain muscle. Other times you can gain muscle without getting stronger. That's why there's a difference between bodybuilding and powerlifting. Um, you know, that's anecdotally speaking. but. But from a scientific perspective, check out his presentation. It's, a, it's a definitely an eye opener and it kind of really supports kind of the whole concept of tri bodybuilding or concurrent training, if you will. Okay, so when it comes to cardio, the energy, for one, the energy, the energy expenditure during the workout will be greater. And then there's the feasibility and practicality component. The frequency of resistance training can be limited by mechanical loading, su such as soreness, DOMS, or delayed onset muscle soreness, etc. Cardio is more feasible due to less localized muscle, muscle damage, hence greater frequency of that uh, of doing cardio. Okay. Um, however, this arch Arthur did touch on the metabolic effect and impact on health status. Now this we can agree with, and there's still much research to be done, but what we do know, tentatively speaking, is that resistance training does tend to be better than cardio for glycemic control. It has a better insulin sensitizing effect on the muscle, which makes sense if you think about it. Um, and then it's also obviously it's gonna be better for lean, lean body mass increase and preservation. And some studies are showing that resistance, this is fascinating stuff I'm finding, but resistance training improves metabolic panel markers such as reduced C-reactive protein levels, et cetera. Um, so there's no denying the unique be benefits of resistance training, and I'm absolutely an advocate and supporter of resistance training. However, I'm also a supporter of cardio, and I see similar unique benefits in cardio, such as VO2 max augmentation or increase, which you're going to get more of an increase in your VO2 max from cardio than weight training, and also the strong associations, positive I should say, uh, between fitness level, uh, v via, via, um, VO2 max, on reduced mortality, a higher thermic effect of, of, of feeding, a higher resting metabolic rate, better heart function and heart health, etc., as well as fat loss and weight loss. All right, so this is the part I'm really interested in talking about. The entire anabolic and catabolic side of things is complex. For instance, insulin is the most potent anabolic hormone in the body, yet I have been reading that it has some dual catabolic effects via its, um, it, it suppresses appetite centrally, via it has a catabolic effect but peripherally uh, on, the, on the muscle tissue, it's anabolic. So, so while the author is somewhat correct on anabolic dysregulation and obesity, which can be supported and vouched for by many studies showing a blunted anabolic response to exercise in those who are obese, so they could have some anabolic dysregulation, which kind of, um, Basically, that, that disagrees with my idea of obese people being overly anabolic, okay? So that's interesting. But let me just kind of break this down here. Um, but the same can be said about just about every other variable, such as thermic effect of, of a meal, glycemic control, etc. These parameters also tend to be blunted in those who are obese. So what this illustrates is obesity in and of itself basically blunts or impairs just about every positive parameter being measured, including the anabolic response to resistance training or exercise. But this does not indicate they have anabolic dysfunction. Recall how I just said insulin has dual effects, right? So insulin can be centrally catabolic but peripherally anabolic. Well, the same can be said about anabolism, right? Studies have found in obese humans and mice anabolic effector pathways are increased, okay? So what does that mean? That means anabolism is increased in obese mice and humans. 
In fact, one researcher concluded that in those inclined to obesity, the body safeguards against weight loss more than, more than it does against weight gain. Okay? But what's more fascinating is this researcher postulated the question, presetting of more activity in anabolic effector pathways. Basically what this means is he's making the postulation that in obesity there's greater anabolic activity. In fact, a thesis study, and this is the only study that I saw that actually used the word anabolic dysregulation, the author remarked that muscle in obesity, so obese muscle, functions at higher rates of anabolism when compared to leaner counterparts. And it's also resistant to the anabolic effect of exercise. That doesn't make sense. So, you, so it's overall has high rate of, of anabolism, but yet it's, it's the effect of the anabolic effect to exercise is blunted. Let me, let, let, let's delve into this a little further as far as why I think this could be. Could this be because the muscle in obesity is already anabolic? Thus, the response is blunted and impaired to exercise. So in a sense, back to Dr. Forbes, uh, more weight to lose, easier to lose weight, and the less weight to lose, the harder to lose weight. Why well, postulate that regarding muscle or the anabolic state, the more muscle we stand to gain, so in other words, if we have a low amount of muscle, it's easier to gain muscle. Whereas if we have a lot of muscle, so if there's less muscle to be gained, it's harder to gain muscle, okay? so. Basically, obese individuals, they have a high total body weight. We're not talking about sarcopenic obesity where it's in an older individual where they're over fat or underweight or over fat and overweight. We're talking about individuals who are over fat and overweight and they also tend to have a high amount of muscle mass because they have a total amount of body mass, a higher total body mass, right? So in a sense, they're already anabolic because they have a lot of muscle mass relative to their body weight. Thus, their anabolic response is impaired. Again, that's my that's my hypothesis. That's my, you know, logical thinking, if you will. Of course, obesity is complex. As I mentioned, a lot of the other parameters we're looking at are blunted from obesity, okay? So uh, here we're going to enter neuropeptide Y, which is NPY. When we think of neuropeptide Y, we want to think of leptin. So leptin, we know, is connected to obesity. And research has shown that altogether leptin appears to generally regulate um, energy homeostasis by decreasing energy intake and increasing energy expenditure. expenditure. Ob in obesity, they have leptin resistance, which is similar to type 2 diabetes and insulin resistance. So obesity, so that's, that's kind of like the you know, behavioral lifestyle uh, induced leptin um, issues, whereas obesity from low levels of leptin, which is a genetic factor, and it's relatively uncommon. It's, it's like it occurs in a very small amount of a small incidence, I think it's 5% or less of the population, which is similar to type 1 diabetes, okay? So in a sense, this whole leptin connection with obesity is not that uh, obese individuals have low levels of leptin. They have high, high levels of leptin, but they're leptin resistant. Their body isn't responding to the leptin. The signaling is just, is just it's, 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 it's disconnected um, or it's not working right. What is neuropeptide Y? Well, neuropeptide Y is a prominent orexogenic, which is basically an overeating molecule. It stimulates overeating and belongs to the class of anabolic effector pathways. Well, guess what? Studies have found that neuropeptide Y levels are elevated in obese populations. Remember, this peptide belongs to an anabolic pathway. Okay? So you have high levels of an anabolic peptide in obese individuals. That makes them overly anabolic. Okay, from a from a molecular perspective, okay, or or a, a endocrine perspective, okay, and in a study it was concluded that redu there's reduced catabolic signaling uh, in obese mice even in the absence of the neuropeptide Y. So this supports my con the systemic signaling concept of theory I've been talking about in a lot of my videos about it's systemic, okay, and indeed my basis for this inherently biased. Uh, you know, biology toward weight gain is evidence-based. In fact, the landmark study that I used, our body is inherently biased towards weight gain. It has to do with, you know, these different, uh, you know, evolutionary and, or theoretic, theoretical concepts. In fact, in the study, the anabolic and catabolic pathways are discussed. Another thing...
I'm ripped 24-7, 365 days of the year. It's a lifestyle lean. So I'm not genetically lean, I'm lifestyle lean, which means I have a profound understanding of the science of weight control and energy balance regulation on a plethora of levels. So the conclusion to this video is that is resistance training beneficial for obesity? Yes, but it depends on the context. And when we talk about context, it's, are we looking at weight loss or health or et cetera? If we're looking at health, it's beneficial because it's going to directly impact the tissue of the muscle. Like I said, weight training has benefits on glycemic control um, and many other factors, okay? And, um, but I think overall, and I strongly believe that concurrent training is really the key to optimizing these benefits and adaptations. Resistance training alone is going to have benefit, but it's not going to result in any significant weight loss, and a plethora of studies bear this. Um, and doing resistance training alone excludes the benefits of cardiovascular training. And the same way, if we do cardiovascular training alone, we exclude the benefits of, of resistance training. So really, the best case scenario is to do both. Um, so anyhow, that's all I want to talk about, folks. Um, and check out the bottom of this video for those studies. And so basically, um, you know, the whole concept of, of try bodybuilding or concurrent training it was actually research to support this, and it's actually research using the term crosstalk, which is basically the the ability of your tissues to, um, you know, how they respond to stimuli when it comes to weight training and cardio. Again, guys, I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm I'm living proof of this stuff. You know, I I I know the part, and I look the part, so I know what I'm talking about. Uh, I still have a lot to learn. Okay, I'm not saying I have all the answers, but. I'm just saying that resistance training is not going to play a key role in weight loss. It may improve health, health to some degree, but cardio improves health as well. And doing both is going to be ideal. So tune in next time. Thanks for watching.